baseball is dead. Rest in peace. Got a got a special show for you guys today. It's a Monday episode of Baseball is Dead. Joey's here. J.A.'s here. Jake on the ones and twos. Dallas, where are you right now? I never know where you are. I am back in Stockton, California. Oh, that's why your internet sucks. Someone actually greatest, tweeted me the, uh, the last the time that you were in Stockton. Someone tweeted me and they're like, bro, you better, you better watch what you say about Stockton because they'll beat your ass. I was like, bro, they, they are far too... Uh, far away from me to do anything uh, Bro, I'm from Saugus Domingo. You don't think <laughs> yeah. I can fuck around and beat someone's ass? That's what I'm saying. Like, you think Stockton's tough? Try, try and live one day in Saugus Domingo. You can't. <laughs> yeah. You absolutely cannot. Uh, it was yeah, an interesting weekend of baseball. Speak the words that are written on fucking road signs out there. What, what is that? Shinnenville, fucking Listen. what? Uh, none of those fucking letters even go together, and Watch you're your saying lips. a word that doesn't even make sense. Watch your lips. It was an interesting Buster. weekend of baseball. Uh, I, I would say when we when we went over the the slate on the Thursday episode, talking about the series that we were going to be watching this weekend, I don't know that many of them lived up to the hype. There were there were some like we'll talk Rays Yanks, we will talk Padres Dodgers, but some of the most interesting things that happened over the weekend were incidents that uh, occurred in series that maybe we didn't highlight. Uh, we also have an interview with Nolan Arenado of the St. Louis Cardinals, the surging St. Louis Cardinals after getting the voicemail treatment. Uh, Bob Guerin, you're going to have to wait, pal, because the St. Louis Cardinals are red hot after getting the BID bump from the voicemail line, as it's been known to do in the past. It's It's been there. It's done that. I actually got the chance to meet Marmel over the weekend. Super nice guy. I, I would love to play for that guy. Super nice. <laughs> I mean, I felt I felt bad that Joey was advocating for his firing and and Bob Guerin to take his place. And Dallas even saying like Dallas straight up said he's like, I hate Bob Guerin, but that guy <laughs> should be back managing in the big leagues for the Cardinals. I did not did not finish off that statement like that. That is not I don't I, yeah, remember I even you, starting think, the statement like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe a cocktail or two, but it's on record. No, I don't. I, I don't believe Ollie Marmol is an, is a terrible individual. I believe he has struggled out of the gate to find footing in a managerial sense. How am I going to make sure these guys know I got their back at the same time? How am I going to get their respect at the same time? How am I going to plant the flag and let them know that there ain't no fucking around in here? It's the Cardinals. He's got to do all of that together. He's got a room full of stars. I don't want to call them aging stars, but he's got a room full of stars that he has to vie for. Like I said, he's got to vie for ground. And it they've got feels an old like team. maybe what's that? They've got an old team. So it's it's that's why I said it's it's him like trying to figure all of that shit out. Right. How, how as a new manager do I get the young guys on board? How do I get the older vets to buy in to, you know, my new coach speak, my new manager speak, if you will. And that's a that's a tough that's a tough line to walk because you're trying to get really two completely different schools of thought all to buy into the same message. And that's the trick when it comes to managing is can you manage the personalities in the clubhouse? And then from there, can you manage the folks above you and how they are disseminating information and what they want done? It's just being a big league manager today is not as easy as people think it is when they just want to throw the stooge title out there. Like, oh, bro, you're just listening to the front office. No, man. I mean, yeah, that's part of it. But there's a whole lot more that goes into this. Yeah. Did Anyways, you know that uh Ollie Oliver Marmel is actually born on the same year as Paul Goldschmidt? Mm. That's an interesting that? dynamic. Cleanup hitter, yeah, your cleanup hitter is looking at you going, What? We're we're the same age. No, I mean that's not a that's the thing about baseball though, is if you understand the information and you have the ability to convey that information almost instantly, whatever kind of conversation has to happen. But that hesitation 
and whether or not I want to believe what you're saying, that goes away. If you've got the information and you're ready to buy in and go to work with me, I don't care who you are. I don't care what you look like. I don't care how much time you've spent in the big one. None of that matters if you're, if you're seeking up with me. That's what they want to hear. A quick correction. Mar- what? Marmol is one year older than Goldschmidt, but oh. he's like five years younger than Adam Wainwright. Wainwright could be his dad. <laughs> Wainwright and- could be his dad. It does help that Marmol is pretty jacked. I think that gets you a lot of respect. Mm-hmm. So I think that and makes he's super up for nice. It. He was a super nice guy. Uh, also, we have to get to our baseball is dead parlay. Jake, will you be joining us this week? Yeah, I'm in this week. Five leg parlay coming your way later in the program. Uh, again, Nolan Arenado on the show who homered in three straight games against the Boston Red Sox at Fenway Park. Uh, So that is coming up. But first, as we always do on the Monday episode of Baseball is Dead, I ask everyone, come to the table. What what tickled your fancy over the weekend? What story is something that stood out to you? Uh, Joseph, did you remember your homework assignment? Yeah, I remembered it. And... I have something very interesting on the table. Okay. What is it? Because last week we talked about the Dodgers and the Padres. This week we talked about the Dodgers and the Padres. They paid twice in a row. And the Dodgers have completely embarrassed them again. They've won 11 out of their last 12 series against the Padres. I mean, how many years is that? That's like two and a half years. That's yeah. That probably goes back to what? 2020. Yeah, so they haven't, and the only series they lost to the Padres was in the playoffs. Which is crazy. But that is crazy. And that's, uh, that, that kind of leads into both stereotypes about these two teams as the Dodgers, best team ever assembled, regular season, best team ever, and choking the playoffs every year. So there's a lot of, and that the Padres are overrated and underperform, even though they have the best players. And right now, that's what's happening. The Padres are, 29th in offense right now. In average. That's crazy. Sorry, not offense, in average. <laughs> but still, they're one of the worst teams. In all. They're, they're 20th in on-base percentage, 20th in OPS, 25th in runs. So they're one of the worst offenses in the league right now. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking at it now. Uh, in the three-game series, uh, you had Mookie Betts hit 333 with a 1611 OPS. Freddie Freeman hit 500 with a 1583 OPS. Then you get the Padres' big boppers. Juan Soto, 250 with an 833 OPS. Tatis, 300 with an 817 OPS. Hassan Kim, 200 with an 800 OPS. JD Martinez had a buck 82. Bogey hit 250. Nelson Cruz, 222. Grisham, 143. Max Muncy's cooled off 100. So, yeah, not a ton of uh, outstanding offensive performers outside of Mookie and Freddie Freeman in this in this uh, Dodgers-Padres showdown. Well, that's the thing. We, we took, Juan Soto has been getting a lot of shit just for being underperforming, but the guy has been on fire the past two weeks. He's up to like having a 150 OPS plus just overnight. Like the mm-hmm. guy is... All right, we can stop talking about how he fell off because he's back. And Tatis is playing well. I mean, Machado's struggling. But the difference between the Padres and the Dodgers is that they both have stars. The Padres just have as many stars as the Dodgers. But the guys who fill in, like the the B-tier players, C-tier players, the bench players, like the Padres have, none of them are doing well. When the Dodgers, their bad players are just as good as their good players. That's called depth. Yes, sir. That's called depth is what that is called. And hasn't that always been something that we have felt like has separated the Los Angeles Dodgers from everybody else? That's always where the conversation goes is that's great. They've got stars. Maybe they don't have names that are jumping off the page at you, but those dudes are raking. And I always go back to this name because he has quietly, in my opinion, been the main ingredient to what this fucking Dodger team has done. And sure, there's been stars that have come and gone, right? But Will Smith just continues to fucking do the damn thing. He just continues to be a dude that shows up 
in the in this lineup. And that right there is a huge like you need stars to perform, you need stars to kind of set the table and do their thing, but to your point Joey, when the stars have a bad week and maybe two of them have a bad week at the same time, what does the production from the other places look like? That is always what is going in my opinion to be separating the contenders with the pretenders or contenders from the pretenders. Did you say tenders? Is do, does the depth <laughs> does the depth match up? Because I always I, I honestly think about playing a baseball game where if you were to take all of the starters and remove them and start the bench and then sprinkle in the starters, what team would you think wins 162? And I think that exercise can be done all across the game. And I think you you might, you know, you find it interesting, find a different answer. But I think when you do stuff like that, you realize, oh, shit, man, if I was asking for, you know, 162 worth of production out of our bench players, I don't I don't think I'd like where we end up. Um, Dallas, what did you uh, bring to the table today? And please tell me it's not something Oakland A's related because no one cares. Uh, no, it's not Oakland A's related. It did happen at the Coliseum, though. Um, the Texas Rangers. <clears throat> oh, Nathan, Nathan Evaldi shoving it up your asshole. Oh, oh my. <laughs> I don't think I sat down for the last three <laughs> of his innings. And he was only one out away from a fucking CG. Um, that was that was a lot of fun to watch. But what it did is it it, it really it. It grabbed my attention and said, look, if this Ranger team, who, again, not fully healthy, but if this Ranger team can continue to pitch the way they're pitching and, and what I'm saying, then maybe Andrew Heaney can figure something like this is a division that more and more starts to look like the Rangers ain't fucking around. More and more, no. it starts to look like the Rangers are saying, um, we, we I, I think we like who we are as a club, and I think if we're where we want to be come July, Rangers very well could be in a position to try to put a firmer grasp on this division. Because what I saw leaves me believing that the Rangers should be pretty confident in what they have going on right now. Nathan Avaldi is riding a 25 and two-thirds innings scoreless streak. He's only allowed 11 hits to three walks with 25 strikeouts. Uh, he set a career high. He set a career high punch outs against, against the A's. 12, just fucking slicing and dicing. Which kind of like, I was gross. surprised that 12 is career high. I know. When I saw that, I was like, 12? Come on. Like, I, I, like I, he's a dude that I would have like 14, 15 minimum, you know, like thinking yeah. that he's got that, he's got that in the bag. But yeah, dude just, throws a hundred. He's got a nasty. I mean, I I told you I taught him the one one split. He was just a four seam guy before that, and then I you know I showed him that one one split, and he's been he's been dominating ever since. Well, that's why and I, I, I love coming to Boston. They love coming mm -hmm. to Boston. Yep. And John Gray, John Gray. I mean, <laughs> I was I was sitting here. We're outside barbecue, and I watched the first batter. And I, I looked over at my buddy. I was like, damn, John Gray looks good today. And we fucking went away, like came back 20 minutes later, it felt like, because the game was kind of moving. And he was like the fourth inning. I was like, yeah, fuck, John Gray looks, he looks really good. <laughs> and then we came back like two innings later. And I was like, son of a bitch. John Gray is really fucking good right now. Really good right now. You know, what, you, know what, you know what hurts? <laughs> I just looked it up since April 18th since April 18th uh, the MLB leader in ERA Eddie Rodriguez 0 -2 third Nathan Evaldi 119 that's over their last five starts each number one and number Eddie, three Eddie where, where's Eddie going this summer I don't know I, I don't know enjoy that, like, nice Nice early spring season in, in in Michigan. You know, they're there to watch it start to warm up and then gone. It's not gonna be late season for Eddie. That's unfortunate. But hey, teams he might be buy that October. contract. I don't know. That's that's gonna be you an interesting so? conversation. By the way, Detroit Tigers, don't count them out. Don't count out those Tigers. Mm. 
I feel like you can count them out. Nah, you can know. count them out. <laughs> Maybe not as sellers, though. I could see them <laughs> feeling pressure to keep like a decent club together. Yeah, they're 18 and 21. And they're only four games back. That's how well, fucking but, awful. So, the so AL Jay, let me ask you this, though. If you're going to keep a decent team together, what is preventing you from trying to put that decent team together right now? And I understand it's not about, you know, it's not like you can just go pull from a free agent pool right now that everybody else. I'm saying. Why aren't you making an effort to try to make some noise in this division? If you feel like like isn't like if, if the pressure is there to keep a shitty group together and I, and when I say shitty I mean less than effective is if there's any pressure to keep a group that you don't have faith in together to an extent wouldn't you be able to like reallocate that pressure and say mm-hmm. well you know what instead of trying to keep these guys together why don't we try to make them a little better I think I think it's just realistically too early to expect any teams to be able to be buyers because you need a seller. And I don't think any teams have really come to grips with fully selling yet. I think we, in the last podcast, I can't remember what the team was, but I, I think there was that initial report that they were investigating, uh, you know, uh, maybe it was the Royals, like what, what a sale, uh, uh, yeah, what a, what a sell off would look like this summer. But I don't think any teams are really engaging in that yet. I, I actually do think that if the Tigers are in the mix for the AL Central, um, by the time that market really does start to activate, I actually do think they will be aggressive in adding to this team. Really? I would like to see that. I would like to see that. It would make the Detroit Tiger fan base really excited. Um, I think it could represent a, a new wave, a, a new momentum push of we're going to be players now, and I don't know what they're waiting on. I don't want to speak to their front office tactics. But that, the, the only reason I ask that question is because I think about, look, if there's just a little pressure to keep a not so great group together, can't we just kind of reapply that pressure to making us a little better when the time comes instead of just holding water? But you got to let some yeah, of these players that we've talked about that have not come through and have not raised their game. That also needs to happen. Otherwise, those ultimately, guys are part I think of the sale. <laughs> Yeah, ultimately, I think they're going to be undone by the fact that they are, like, at best, the third best roster in the division and more likely the fourth best. In, like, the, just, in the worst division in the league. <laughs> yeah, in the worst. Like, that's a, that's a tough calculation for a front office to make, I think, if you're a, a, an objectively below average roster that whose young players are not progressing and or not healthy uh, at the rate that you were hoping and you are in the mix for like a historically terrible division. Like, what do you do? Um, maybe the simple answer is you just hold, hold Pat and you see how it plays out. That's the lowest risk move, I think. But we're a little while from that. And I do expect the Guardians and the Twins to, to pull away a little bit. Hmm. Um, Jay, hey, what do you got? Joey and I were on the of length. Um, I had the Padres. Um, it was kind of a two-parter thing, and Joey hit both of them. It was the Padres losing as a team and Juan Soto turning it on as an individual. Um, just to add a little bit to what was said, obviously the Padres have lost five straight and seven of eight, uh, and they're seven back in the West. So it's not just a problem with the Dodgers thing. This is a problem with the roster overall, I think, as you guys have laid out. Uh, and then Soto, through April 26th, was slashing 178, 339, 344. He has over a 1,200... OPS since that point and has raised his OPS by 202 points over that span. He's basically back to his career mark um, across the board, uh, which is kind of crazy given how ice cold he was. And I do think it's mostly time to table the talk that, um, you know, there was serious concern with Soto, which is good because we'd all prefer that he be awesome Mm -hmm. (laughs) and the Padres need him to be. I don't think people understand the process that has to occur when you are as good of a player as a guy like Juan Soto is and things aren't going well. It's not a complete revamp of your approach, but there's some work to do. There's some work to do. I watched Matt Olson do this very thing, told that he was never going to hit lefties, told that he was going to platoon, told that he just couldn't get the bat to the ball in certain spaces against certain guys. And I watched Matt Olson go, yeah, watch this. And I watched him work his fucking ass off 
every single day. Matt Olson didn't come with the with the superstar power, the superstar hype that Juan Soto did. But just like Juan Soto has done, the dude put his head down and he worked. And there weren't Instagram reels and there weren't tweets about it. All you saw was him turn into a perennial all-star player, a perennial power hitter who went and netted him a nice, fat, juicy contract because of the work he put in. Juan Soto's got the paycheck. What you like to see is what we talk about, what I talk about specifically. A guy who gets breaded up can make one or two decisions to continue to try to grind and get better. Now he has nothing to worry about, or he kind of downshifts and says, hey, I made it. I got my paycheck. Juan Soto does not appear to be the downshifting type, which is really, really good to see. I don't think anybody thought that about him anyway, but you got to put the fucking work in, man, and that's what Juan Soto does. This shit doesn't come overnight. You got to make adjustments. You got to take steps back in order to start feeling comfortable in those adjustments, and then they start to play out. This is a, I, I kind of wanted to take this discussion in a couple of different directions. Uh, first, it, I, I don't want to go the negative route. I want to start by saying the Los Angeles Dodgers have now overtaken the Atlanta Braves for the best record in the National League after this sweep. Uh, separate discussion that we can get into in a little bit, but uh, the Atlanta Braves did get swept by the Toronto Blue Jays over the weekend. They have lost four straight games and the Dodgers have won five while the Padres have lost five straight and to the earlier point the San Diego Padres are seven games back um I I kind of wanted to do somewhat of a deeper dive into why are the Padres not clicking why are they not winning baseball games why is it that They have gone out and won the offseason and won the trade deadline how many times over the last three years. And here we are talking about a team that entering play on May 15th is under 500 in third place in the division and is once again getting slapped around by the uh, the cream of the crop, the kings of the division, uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers. Why? I think it just like comes down to like the the like I said earlier the B tier players that they have like players like Jay Cronenworth who are great players who aren't they're not Soto they're not Tatis but they still need to do well like Cronenworth Austin Nola Ha Sung Kim Trent Grissom even Nelson Cruz like all these guys are either average or below average this year are struggling and that's gonna kill you. Like, it doesn't really matter if you have the best players in the league, which they do, hitters. They can go off. But if everyone else isn't performing, you're not going to be one of the top five offenses in the league, which is what's happening. Jared, here's the list of teams that do not have as good of an OPS as the San Diego Padres. The Cincinnati Reds don't. The A's, they don't. The White Sox, they don't. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Marlins, they don't. The Nationals, they don't as well. The Seattle Mariners, they don't. Uh, The Astros, they do not, which is interesting. Two AL West teams there uh, that fancy themselves contenders. Uh, The Tigers do not, and the Guardians do not. So if the Padres were going to be banging baseballs in the NL West against the Dodgers, they're going to have to be significantly better than all of those teams I just mentioned. And they are barely better, barely better than all of those teams I just mentioned. Literally less than 50 points separates the last place Cleveland Guardians from the San Diego Padres in OPS. Well, the other thing, too, that's not good. Like when when Joe brings up the point of the complimentary players and how they need to be better and and the best players can't carry the load. I don't know that the best players are carrying much of a load. Like looking at it right now, I know that Fernando Tatis Jr. has only played 21 games, but that's a 100 plate appearance sample size. It's not it's not huge. It's not small, but it's not it's not, you know, we're, we're not going to say that this is what Tatis is. He's been fine. He's been good. He's actually been the best out of, out of all those guys. Uh, but you take the combination of Tatis, Bogarts, Soto and Machado. Those four guys combined 
are hitting 256 with a 785 OPS, which, you know, if that's if that's your uh, number six hitter, if that's your number eight hitter, you're like, oh, yeah, you know, that's you know, that makes the lineup longer. A 785 OPS. That's pretty good. You know, somewhere down like the, the bottom third of the lineup. But when you trot out a fucking World Series parade type sh- uh, show for 150,000 screaming Padres fans and you have Tatis Bogarts and Soto and Machado up there like they're the Beatles and the production that you've gotten out of them combined to this point is 256 with a 785 OPS. That's just I mean, <clears throat> it's not bad. We're not saying yikes, that's awful. You're looking at that saying, well, that. That needs to be substantially better for the well, collection of well, talent that they have. Also, it's, isn't it's, it? I mean, go ahead, Jay. The vast majority of that is Machado because Bogart, Soto, and Tatis on a per game basis are playing at a well above average rate and a rate collectively that you would be fine with from those three players. It's Machado who's really not carrying his weight. And then it's a combination of the other guys. Lack, like as you said, Tatis didn't play. He's played half as as many games as those other guys. Uh, and as we outlined earlier, Soto's production has, by and large, come in a very concentrated period of time. Which, like, I know the bottom line looks the same, but that can impact how your season's going when you get a below average first month from Juan Soto, while Fernando Tatis is also not playing, and Manny Machado is also playing poorly. Like that can be compounding, I think. And yes, it's great that Soto has turned it around and his last two weeks have been like mind melting hot. But um, but that's only a certain number of games, right, that he's been able to impact over that stretch. So like, I think you're right. I To me, I know the depth is important, but to me, it's just as much about the stars and to go to the pitching really fast, like. Well, they're both. That's where I was going, Jay. That that's yeah. where, like, both both groups, right? The starters and the relievers are extremely, extremely <laughs> average right now. Well, they and, are, and Musgrove has been the bad. Pack. Yeah, and Musgrove is supposed to be their best or their their ace, their co ace. However, you look at him and Darvish, and he has been horrible. He has a six six three ERA, and he missed whatever it was the first month plus of the season. He's only thrown nineteen innings. Uh, I just don't know how good we expect the rotation to be of you, Darvish, Blake Snell, Seth Lugo, Michael Waka, and then like a mix of like Nick Martinez and Ryan right. Weathers. Like, that's right. fine. That's fine. What makes this a championship caliber pitching staff potentially is if you have you, Darvish, and Joe Musgrove and Blake Snell all pitching dealing. at, yeah, dealing at their peak powers. And right now, like, I guess you could say one of those people is doing that in Darvish because Snell's not pitching and, particularly well either. Like it's and and the whole and the whole Seth Lugo Waka thing is those are two guys that you need to perform. Like I don't want to say have career years, but if they aren't performing closer to their best and are instead performing closer to their median performances or maybe even slightly below, that is not helping anybody. And that is, I think, one of the issues. You have an offense that is struggling to create runs to the point where they're in the lower third of baseball collectively. And then you have a pitching staff on both fronts, starting and relieving, that is just eh right now. Just just kind of eh. Seth and Lugo 50 has been per- pretty good. <laughs> yeah. No, Lugo's been That's, great. Oh, yeah. The um, has been what dumpy, Jay is saying, like, is, yeah. yeah, you need you need all these. You, you need all of this. Yeah. And like, honestly, like we we just... The World Series parade, the photos of all their stars. Like, listen, at the end of the day, if 50% of your star players are going to be either way worse than you anticipated or not available, then you're not going to be anywhere near as good as we thought. And the Dodgers players have been available. The Dodgers stars have been available. And that's part of the reason why they're seven games ahead of the Padres right now. They got Mookie Betts playing the fucking infield and just, meh, all good. <laughs> It's all good. <laughs> also, like, n- not that it's a huge talking point, but you're kind of seeing why teams were hesitant to give a multi-year deal to Michael Walker because all the data from last year would tell you that it was a, I don't want to say lucky or fluky, but it, it wasn't true to you what just, it looked like. You just did. No, I didn't. 
it, it wasn't true to what it looked like. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, you're kind of seeing that now with the Padres where seven starts into his Padres career. What they give him four years? Anyway, 482 ERA. <laughs> so I can't believe you just said Michael Walker has to pitch with a horseshoe <laughs> up his ass. That's unbelievable. Maybe well, it's time to tap into the, the farm system for the Padres because they got a hilarious AAA team. Julio Tehran, Cole Hamels. Cole Hamels? <laughs> yeah. They got Craig Stammen down there. They got, don't forget about Pedro uh, Severino down there. They got a lot of big league talent. That is just the, the vettiest <laughs> vet fucking staff in 3A right now. I think Hamels is clocking in at like 82. Cole <laughs> Hamels is riding buses right now. Oh yeah, yeah, he's, he's trying. He's trying to make they it back. Triplet. But if, but he <laughs> want. I think the preseason report is that he like signed with them and then had to start the throwing process basically. So he, he at the earliest he wouldn't be ready until like he July like, or something like that. <laughs> Cole was like, "Oh shit, you guys are in." Um, all right, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Glove. we gotta fucking, we gotta go, we gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. I did oh. not know that. <clears throat> I mean, Dude, I should have. I mean, it was in that wave. Like when I was down in Fort Myers, that's when I found out that Nelson Cruz was on the Padres. I was like, "Who the fuck?" Like they just have everybody, and they're still not good. Well, the problem is, is that Nelson Cruz isn't good anymore either. Yeah, I, I was mean, just that, surprised uh, talk to about, see him. I talk about like a hot coach. potato, like Nelson Cruz. Like, God bless him. He was he was good like ten years longer than I think anybody anticipated. Yeah, Nelly, <laughs> revamp, baby. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, the Padres were almost it, it it's like they were put together by like a casual baseball fan. <laughs> where they're just oh, I know who Nelson Cruz is. Yeah. Rude Nino Dor- he's the guy that punched Batista. Yeah, get him in here. <laughs> like, like that's really like how it feels like they were constructed at times. <clears throat> Obviously, you know, Machado and uh Soto and Bogarts and Tatis, those are all guys that so- you want on your baseball team, no doubt. But then some Here's- of the complimentary pieces. It's like, oh, Jake Cronenworth had a good year. Eight-year deal. <laughs> oh, you Darvish? <laughs> I know who that is. Yeah, six years. How old is he? 36? Yeah, yeah, Make it eight. <laughs> like they, It's crazy. It's crazy how they've just done this to their team. Let's, let, the let's Gucci just, store, let's, bro. Yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's put a bow on this with this. As of right now, the Padres are seven games out of the NL West. Mm-hmm. Do we ever think they get back to even with the Dodgers? No. Because remember, we're, we're just a month and a half into this thing. The, the and, best thing that they got going for them is that they don't see the Dodgers again until August. <laughs> so, they're, they're, <laughs> so they're not going to get slapped around by the Dodgers again for a while. So, all right. So if the Giants and the, or excuse me, if the Padres are seven back from the Dodgers and we don't see them getting back to water. um. <clears throat> Well, I guess I don't want I don't want to go through the whole divisions, but we'll stick on that. But yeah, that that's that again, I go back to the Padres <clears throat> era. I go back to the Dodgers and the Giants a few years ago and that jockeying over 40 games. That's why I asked that question, is because we have seen that happen where teams can just play the best baseball they've played for a month straight and nothing changes in the standings. So it's not a it's getting late early type of situation for the Padres, but it very well could be getting late early for the Padres if shit does not turn around soon. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I just I just think that uh, you're counting on the Dodgers also having a lull at some point, and I don't know why you would count on that. Um, well, you can't. I mean, but I don't know how many people sat there and thought that either the Dodgers or the Giants at that time were like going to win fucking... 30 out of the 35 games they played all at the same time too. That was that, that was yeah. really tough to do and that happened. So yeah, it's it's not like you see the Dodgers going on this huge skid, but if it's seven games right now that separates them, we don't see that as something that the Padres can overcome, then it's getting awfully fucking late, awfully early. Yeah. Yeah. This is it ain't happening. It ain't happening. I'm not I'm not I'm not buying Padres stock right now. 
Uh, the baseball season's in full swing. Whether you're rooting for the home team or betting on your favorite player, DraftKings Sportsbook has got you covered for all this season's action. And right now, new customers can place a $5 bet and get $150 in bonus bets instantly. Plus, everyone can hit one out of the park with DraftKings stepped up same game parlays. Boost your winnings with each leg you add up to 100%. This would be the time. That we uh, do our Baseball is Dead Monday parlay, which is going to have five legs. Now that Jake is joining in, uh, last week's parlay was a four leg parlay that was fucked up because of Joe. I hit, Dallas hit, Jay Hay hit, big swing and a miss by Joseph. Yeah, man, uh, I'm going to tell you right now, we're not just going to we're not just going to pass by the fact that it was the Oakland A's that carried that fucking parlay. We're going to have I'll put it like this. The victories I can celebrate with the Oakland A's may be fewer and farther between than some of your other victories, so I will take the time to celebrate those victories. That's all. Move on. Congratulations, Dallas. That's all. We couldn't That's have all. done just it without the couldn't A's. Have done it without the green and gold. We couldn't have got that L without the green and gold. Even when they, even when the green and gold, even when they perform, win, we lose. Yeah. <laughs> even when we win, we lose. Um, all right, so let's start there, Dallas, with the first leg of the Monday baseball is dead parlay. Your pick. Uh, that's easy. That's easy. We're going to take Shohei. We're going to take the over on six and a half punchies. Shohei against Baltimore. Book that. Okay. Jake, you writing this down? <laughs> Yeah, I got it. Uh, all right. Shohei, over six and a half strikeouts. Jay Hay, your leg. Uh, the Astros minus 1.5, and that, you get plus 110 on that, by the way, against mm. the Cubbies today. That's Framber Valdez against Jamison Tyon. Go with the Astros minus 1.5. Okay. Um, Joseph. I got Shohei over <laughs> eight strikeouts. To get eight plus strikeouts. Can you do that? I don't know. You can't do that. <laughs> no, you can't do what, that. What are, you, what are you doing? What do you mean, what, what am I do? doing? How that's, am I supposed to know what Dallas is going to pick six and a half? To me, that's weak because he's going to get at least eight, probably nine. But I, I'm not the fucking book, Joe. I'm <laughs> just the dude looking at the numbers. Well, my betting uh, <laughs> analyst sent me the lines today and I got the lines in. Mm-hmm. And I'm mm. looking at Shohei Otani, eight plus strikeouts, plus 132. To me, that's better value than whatever line it. Dallas got. I we can't do can... a parlay with those two in the same. Yeah. Is there, is there another pick maybe, Joseph, that you have? <laughs> yeah, you could come back to Joe, me. Joe, does this bet exist on the DraftKings Sportsbook? <laughs> <laughs> while while, while Joey is does. looking for a, a new pick, uh, Jake, what do you got? Um, Tanner Houck's on the bump tonight for the Red Sox. If you've watched any of his starts this year, you know that he is nasty through the first part of the lineup. Second time through, he sucks. Third time through, he sucks. So I'm going Red Sox to win the first three innings at minus 115. Ooh. Hey. I like that pick. Hey. Look at that. Look at that. <clears throat> Love that pick. And if you don't like it, how the first three innings turn out, well, look, you got a little ball game left. You can go yeah. dabble on the last. Yeah. Uh, I... I'm going Jordan Alvarez to get a hit. He is two for six with a home run against Jamison Tyon, who sucks. Uh, he's got a 641 ERA. Also, uh, Jordan has a 561 slug and a 955 OPS against right-handed pitching this year. So Jordan Alvarez to get a hit. <laughs> And I got the Mariners winning the first three innings uh, against the Reds. <laughs> no, nah, no, nah, I'm just playing around, guys. I'm just playing around. Obviously, <laughs> that's not going to work. But I'll tell you what will no, work. Sure isn't. And as much, gonna work. much as this pains me to say, I think you mm-hmm. just take the Mets money line against Patrick Corbin. Pretty much, you got minus 155 mm-hmm. on DKF. How do you say? DK, <laughs> DKS. So, <laughs> TKF, man. <laughs> what the F is You just make, you just combine. What a fumble IKF. fuck. <laughs> just, an, just an all-time gotta, poor performance yeah. out of Joe. Gotta wonder if week, week one's already in the uh, dome. Yeah. yeah. You go log yeah. on to DKF. Yeah. He's got yeah. the yips. Flustered. 
He's got the he's got the the parlay yips right now. Join the big league action right now on DraftKings Sportsbook. Download the app. Sign up with the promo code Jared J A R E D. New customers can bet just five dollars on any bet and get one hundred and fifty dollars in bonus bets instantly. Only at the DraftKings Sportsbook with promo code Jared. Uh, if you're listening right now and you're like, "Damn, I'm listening on Tuesday. I wish I knew about this parlay yesterday." Uh, we will be uh, as soon as we make the picks on the podcast. If you're on Instagram, if you're on Twitter, we will be posting the picks on social as soon as we can so that uh, everyone can see them and you can ride with the podcast if you so choose, if you so choose. All right, before we get into anything else, the other topics that uh, we teased earlier, we did tell you that we have an interview with Nolan Arenado, which took place on Saturday, no, Sunday at Fenway Park. Uh, before he homered for a third time. One of the things we talked about, obviously, is that he had homered in the first two games. And I was like, bro, chill out. Like, you need to relax. And then he just laughed. And then he fucking hit another one. <laughs> like, it's, it's like the internet meme. I'll fucking do it again. And, and he did. So uh, without further ado, Nolan Arenado. Nolan Arenado, St. Louis Cardinals. I think, I think you did like your first interview ever. Like once you got... To St. Louis, you were with me in Dallas at some point, like right. So, because we got ripped off, you went on with us right after the trade, and you were like, "Yeah, like I'm not, I'm not opting out." And then over the off season, people were like, "Yeah, no one's not opting out," and they're like, "Oh my god, breaking news!" I was like, "He told us that two years ago. Like, what are we talking about? <laughs> how has uh, how has the St. Louis experience been in the in the in the years that you've now been there? It's been great. I've been it's been really great. Um, this year we started off a little slow, but we're starting to you know turn it on again, hopefully. And uh, but it's been amazing, man. I love St. Louis. I love living there, and uh, I love my teammates, man. It's been a lot of fun. I mean, can you stop though? Just like <laughs> just like take today off because uh, the Boston Red Sox are trying to uh, we're trying to figure it out over here. No one believed in us coming into the season, and it was funny. Like we were talking before we went on here about how you guys saw like two of the best starting pitching outings of the entire season. You got to see Sale, who was great. You got to see Paxton, who was great. Nine strikeouts. You homered off both guys. <laughs> well, they. Paxton was a, a two strike over the plate and sailed through the first fastball of the day down in the zone. But like I said, he, he's been living, he was living up in the zone all day. And uh, like I said, if I, if I was going to get a hit off sale that day, it had to be down and I was able to hit a mistake, but he was really good. They were both really good. How hard is it? Like, how hard is it to be humble when you're Nolan Arenado? Like when you're just like, yeah, I got a platinum glove and I can also like drive in a buck 30 and I can probably <laughs> hit you 40 bombs. Like when you're that good, how do you keep yourself from believing that, you're just like you're walking on water. How do you do that? I wouldn't well, be able to do that. Well, if you saw the April that I had, it'd be, it'd be pretty easy. <laughs> that's one year. It, it's all right. That's one you, month. You, you would probably see why you are. I mean, yeah. that's just baseball, man. You can't get too big here. Um, this isn't like other sports. You know, you, like I said, I, I, all of April, I really got dominated in a little bit of May. But lately, I've been hitting the ball better. But uh, like I said, that's why. Yeah. I mean, it's I mean, it's fun to to watch you figure it out. Uh, I knew that you would at some point. It I, Unfortunately, it's been <laughs> happening a lot in this series. Uh, but I want to talk to you about the World Baseball Classic because that experience. I mean, I, th- I thought the 2017 one was kind of like the peak with like the Adam Jones catch and like USA winning it all. You being a part of this one. What was it like as a player to kind of go there share a clubhouse with guys like Mike Trout and you look around, there's Mookie Betts, like all these other guys. You've been on plenty of all-star teams, but what was different about playing in in a game like in like that with, with games that matter versus like an all-star team? Yeah, well, I think, well, first off, I mean, the hardest thing to do in those situations is come together, right? You know, you only get two weeks, you don't really know each other. Sometimes egos can get in the way, um, but I, I, I will say that our team, no, nobody's nobody's ego got in the way. We were all there for one mission, is that was the win ball games. And uh, I feel like uh, when we lost to Mexico, it was kind of like a little wake up call. Like, hey man, nobody's gonna take us lightly. Every game was pretty tough, to be quite honest. Um, and then uh, we played really well. The Venezuela game was one of the best experiences of my life as a baseball player. I mean, those fans were rowdy. That team was very good. That was a great win for USA. And then obviously Japan beat us in the finals, but it was such a tough game and uh, they had great pitching. But just playing with those guys, seeing the routines and seeing how good they are, it was special. And uh, sometimes I think like what I think about when I'm hitting or what I think about how bad I am all the time, those guys kind of think about the same thing too. You know, they're like, man, I don't feel right. This doesn't feel right. And then I'm like, man, you look so good. And mm-hmm. then they say the same thing to me. Like, you look so good. I'm like, no, I know, but I don't feel right. So <laughs> it's just funny how those conversations happen. But uh, 
you know, it, it was fun being around them and learning from them. So like, that's what I was going to ask next about like learning from them. Like you're, you're a veteran now. Uh, we're basically the same age, right? I'm 32. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're basically the same age. <laughs> I, I feel like that's so weird. Um, <laughs> Is there anything that you picked up from those guys? Is there anything that you can pick up from other guys, like having played in the league for as long as you have? Is there a way that you can kind of like look at a, a guy that, that goes about his work a certain way? Or are you thinking like, I don't want to deviate from the way that I've always done it? Yeah, I mean, well, I think it's just all those players. I mean, they all have their routines. Um, I was just so fascinated with obviously watching Mike Trout's routine. There's a lot of things that he does that I do in my routine. Same with Mookie. Um, Trey Turner was a lot of fun to watch. He doesn't like taking BP. Um, which is you know, weird. It, which is weird because he's so good. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, he just, he's like really into it. Like his routine is his routine. You know, like sometimes you think these guys are going to go up there and hit bombs and, you know, in batting practice and they're just shooting balls at second base. And <laughs> yeah. you're like, what? No way. That's him. But, uh, you know, that's just, just watching them, the routines and how they stay within themselves is something that I learned that I need to do a better job of as a baseball player is staying within myself. Sometimes I get a little excited and I want to do a little bit more. Watching those guys like JT Realmuto always stays within himself. I think that's how you become a better baseball player, and I took that from them. One of the things that I always tell people uh, whenever you come up is that during the COVID season, when we didn't know when the next MLB game was going to be played, you were still practicing and preparing like Game 7 of the World Series was <laughs> yeah. tomorrow. Um, how difficult, if at all, have you found it to kind of keep that competitive edge? Because I, from like a sports psychology perspective, I think it's fascinating when you've got guys like Chris Sale, who you just faced, like he's just super intense all the time. Like people that are watching this right now, they'll be like, that guy seems pretty tame. Like that yeah. guy seems like pretty nice guy, like low level energy. But like when, when it's game time, like you turn it on. How have you found that you've been able to maintain that? Yeah, well, I think... Um probably by doing a little bit less, you know, I mean, there, I think there's, as you get older, there's certain things you can and can't do. You know, I don't lift the same as I did when I was 24. Um, I definitely don't take ground balls the same as I was 24, but as I've gotten older, I'm trying to just make sure I maximize, like when I do it, I make sure I do it right. So I make sure, you know, that's, that's what I end on. I don't, you know, when I was younger, I would just keep going and keep going. Cause I could just do it nowadays. I don't think that's the best thing for me. I'm just trying to make sure I can maintain, but, uh, keeping that competitive is, is pretty easy because I still want to be a good baseball player mm -hmm. and I still want to perform. So, as far as that goes, that's easy. Yeah. Last year, uh, they are going to make a movie about the way that Albert Pujols went out. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, I feel like the opening scene would be you being like, yo, where is the farewell tour for Albert? Like, why do all these other guys get this farewell tour? And like, what's going on with Albert? He ends up in St. Louis and we know what he does. He hits the 700 uh, in dramatic fashion. What was that like to have a front row seat to the the second half of last season, seeing what Albert did, what he means to the city of St. Louis and being a fan of his like yeah. you're you're a teammate, but you're also a fan and vice For versa. Sure. What was that like? Well, I mean, it was crazy. I mean, I mean, there was a point in the first half where Albert, you know, he wasn't happy with how he was playing um, and uh, he was down. You know, he could tell he was not happy at all. He's like, I don't you know. I don't know. This, uh, this is not who I want to be. This is not mm -hmm. the player I am. And then all of a sudden it started clicking. And then in the second half, I mean, you know, me and Goldie played really well in the second half, but we played really, you know, I played really poor in September and Albert really carried us literally to the playoffs at the end because he was just hitting homers. I mean, he was, I think statistically he was the best hitter in baseball. He Aaron was, Judge, yeah. You know, so like, you know, what he was doing was unbelievable and just watching his routine, his cage work. I mean, I never saw him roll over twice in a row. I mean, he would just do things that like, I would never see. He would he would hit off the machine super close, super fast, and just hit linias everywhere. I mean, he would just do things. I'm like, I can't believe I'm watching this right now. Mm -hmm. And then going the game, I mean, just going. We'd be down one. I'm on first. I'm like Albert's hitting. I'm like, all right, we need a big hit here. Homer, take the lead. You know, everything was to take the lead or to tie the ball game. It was yeah. just unbelievable, and uh, just an unbelievable person too. Just you know how he carries himself. And uh, I remember I offered him a. A bottle of wine just to congratulate him he's like nah man i don't drink I, i've never drink i've never had a drink before ever and i was like what robert pools <laughs> and you play major league baseball man yeah. like how are you you've been on yeah, a flight yeah, before yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, a couple offers you need a drink you know but he's just a different dude man he's a he's next level and uh i get the chills thinking about him and uh how great he was to me and how great he's been to me and he's awesome yeah that was uh that, I'm, I'm dead serious like there's going to be a movie made about that it was just it, if if you had told someone before the year that like hey this is how it's going to play out no one would have believed it um i want to ask you about playing here in boston because i feel like you see the ball well here and uh what what is it about is it like 
because again, going back to like the sports psychology aspect of things is, do you feel kind of like a rush of energy when you come to a ballpark? What's like, man, like Babe Ruth played here. And like, do you feel that as a major league baseball player when you step in the box and do you take from that? Yeah. I mean, just like I said, we, we stay in, you know, the hotel close to the ballpark and uh, walking here, just the energy before the game is the best and seeing all the people, all, everybody out the bars already getting ready for the game with their jerseys on and, uh, it's a pretty cool environment. It's a young environment too. You know, it's not you know older people. It's mostly young people just excited about baseball. So that gets me fired up here. And then obviously, just when I come to this ballpark, I think about Jason Veritek, A Rod. I think about you know Derek Jeter. You know, mm -hmm. I think about those big games. You know, the fights, the the rivalry, Manny Ramirez. You know, mm -hmm. so it's just cool to step on the same field as those guys. And uh, obviously, I, I like seeing the ball. I like knowing that the fence is only three ten to the left, <laughs> yeah. and I like to pull the ball. So <laughs> it's a good feeling that I don't have to try to do too much to hit a ball out. But uh, like I said, I just think about all those guys and like you said, Babe Ruth and just, you know, I just think about that rivalry, just watching it and just being here. Yeah. I mean, because I remember that like the first time that we ever interviewed you was in spring training of 2019 and we talked about the rivalry and like you mentioned, like the 0304 part of it. Like when you were growing up, was there anyone because I can't see it. Was there anyone that you modeled your swing after? And was it was it anyone like in that equation there? I mean, A Rod was something I always try to watch. His I could swing, see a little bit of that. Swing. Yeah, uh, Manor Ramirez, but he's just so elite that I couldn't do that. But uh, like, if you looked at a video of your swing right now, could you see kind of like we break it down like genetically? Like, oh, there's a piece <laughs> of that in there, and there's a piece of that in there. I mean, they're so they were so good, man. I don't think I, I, I could do that. <laughs> Matt, Matt Holiday is the one guy I used to try to mimic my swing after Matt. Holiday. I could see I that liked too. him a lot, and he had the way he stayed through the baseball. But Manor Ramirez is just one of the greatest hitters of all time righties and uh you know I, I i couldn't do that you know what he did but uh you know i just loved watching him play and uh like i said i mean those guys were just so elite those teams were elite you know mm -hmm. what i mean there's just such good star players on both sides it was fun to watch yeah a lot of people say i have a uh, very similar swing to manny ramirez <laughs> a lot of people would say that that's the best well <laughs> <laughs> one last thing uh the the rule changes what have you noticed um playing like what what have been the biggest differences for you as a player either offensively or defensively um well from a defensive standpoint it's great to not be on your feet for so long yeah i think from a health standpoint i think it's going to help us as the year goes on that we're not gonna be like as tired getting off our feet uh, from a hitter standpoint i really don't like it um i don't like you know swinging at a foul ball taking a deep breath and then i look it's like 12 seconds i'm like oh, oh no i gotta get in the box you yeah. know i don't like that that part of it. I don't like the part where I get the two strikes and I got to like still get in the box quickly. You know, sometimes I like to think like slow my brain down, slow things down. And uh, I think with the, the clock, it kind of speeds you up more than I would like personally. But uh, I'm starting to get used to it. I'm starting to get better at it. Um, you know, in the spring training, I didn't get a lot of bats with it because the WBC, they didn't have those rules. Yeah. So um, I, I, I'm a little late to it, but I'm not a fan of in the box, to be quite honest with you. Mm -hmm. Everything else I'm fine I'm fine with. But like the, you have to be like engaged with the pitcher by eight seconds. Yeah, I just think, you know, I don't want to have to be worried about the clock when I'm up, walk, walking up there. You know, when I'm facing Chris Sale and he's throwing 95 <laughs> to 98, you know, I'm yeah. just trying to like slow that down as right. much as possible. And yeah. I don't want to rush to get in the box. Okay. One last thing before we let you go. Uh, you guys spent a lot of time on flights and hotels. Give me a, a movie recommendation, something that you've watched recently that I need to check out. Wow movie yeah. i haven't been on movies i've been on shows okay, i'm watching show. i'm re-watching re band of brothers okay that's a great one great one yep. uh, um i'm watching house of dragons what's that it's like game of thrones oh uh, i've never i didn't do game yeah, of thrones and then i kind of yeah. rewatched. Uh, I, I did entourage again again yeah. i have those all on dvd uh, Harry yeah, gold yeah. is the best yeah uh, i mean for me those <laughs> that's the greatest character of all right time. band of brothers is gonna be a solid rewatch. i'm yeah. gonna have to pick that up for the offseason <laughs> yeah, good all right nolan arenado st louis cardinals thank you so much no, i appreciate you man. thank you Bryce Harper chose violence yesterday. Uh, <laughs> and you would see, if you see a benches clearing incident, you would assume that the violence would take place from a physical standpoint. Uh, this was mental warfare for Bryce Harper. <laughs> the biggest blow thrown in this exchange was not a haymaker. It was not a kick. <laughs> It was not a punch. It was cuts not a like headbutt. A knife. It, it was Bryce like Harper. It was Bryce Harper saying, you're a loser fucking organization. Every single one of you. <laughs> That's like, you're ready to square up and, and that gets dropped on you and you're like, bro. <laughs> like, you, what are you going to say to that? You're going to be like, I know. Are you fucking. I know, but like, fight me anyway. <laughs>
<laughs> Bryce Harper. I'm just, not a fucking loser. You're a loser. <laughs> like, no. Like, no, I I was just in the World Series last year. I've got two MVPs and 300 million in the bank account. Like, what are you going to say to me? Um, That was very funny. I, I, I hated that it was like, like Moustakis caught the stray there. Like, oh, because he was staring right at Moose when he yeah. said it, right? He just fucking, you're a fucking loser. <laughs> All of you, the whole fucking organization. <laughs> Moose is like, what the fuck, bro? I'm just yeah. trying. Yeah, like, Moose I'm, is to like, I'm trying to here. break like, this up. He's like, I'm a fucking, I'm a Kansas City Royal. Like, don't, don't, <laughs> right. don't load yeah. me in with the Rockies. I'm just trying well, to stay in the That's where you want to see Moose leagues. go, you remember 15, bitch? You remember 15? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not on this fucking. What if Mustagas turns around and is like, you know what, Bryce, you're right. Hey, fuck you guys. All of you guys. Each and yeah. every one of you guys. That's yeah. what I was thinking, like, man. Remember 2015? I was the MVP. You were World Series champ. Now look at you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a, just a couple of champs here talking to a bunch of fucking losers. Huh? Yeah, you yeah. guys, get your shit together. You guys should think about getting better players over there. Yeah. Man. <laughs> I, I was thinking that same thing watching this because I've never been in a bench clearing brawl, especially not in the major leagues. But like this guy yeah. pitching for the Rockies, like I'm, I don't know who he is, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of guys on the Rockies aren't really close to him. They don't really have, I don't know, I don't know what it's like in the clubhouse, but a lot of them probably know Bryce Harper. And if Bryce Harper's fighting with the reliever, and you're someone like Chris Bryant, who's known Bryce Harper like since like third grade, you're kind of pr- halfway on Bryce Harper's side. You know, like these bench clearing brawls. I got to assume like, but then when he calls the whole team a bitch, you might not be on his side as much. Because I don't know how these work. I mean, Dallas, you probably, no, you see, probably know more than me. Like, nope. this has happened. Like, I feel like there's all these yeah, teams are yeah, fighting, yeah, but yeah. they're not really fighting each other. There's like one-on-ones and then. Well, that's, that's, there you go. That's it, Joe. That's it. That's exactly it, right? Like if if we if our team, like let's say we were a baseball team and we cleared benches with a, a you know another podcast, another whatever, like yeah, you know, like I, I I know these guys, I know some of these guys, but let's say you Joe didn't know any of them, right? And you're like, no man, it's it's fuck that dude. You know what? Fuck Trevor Plouffe, absolutely <laughs> fuck him, fuck his haircut, fuck everything about that dude. I'd be like, look, I understand you're angry, all right? And if you're going to square up with Ploopy, like, you know, hey, that's going to be a you and him thing, but I can't, like, I'm not going to let you and Jake and J- and Jay Hay jump in on Ploopy. I'm not going to let that, I can't let that happen. You know, you, you kind of let it go and, you know, it's going to work itself out because if he's like, yo, I don't fucking, I don't know that fucking YouTuber that you guys <laughs> fucking around with. I got some shit to say to that dude. I'll be like, look, you're, you're a little bigger than him, all right? He's got a little attitude. I get it, but if you guys are going to figure this out, fuck you guys are going to figure this out. But the minute I see, you know, fuck somebody from, from Ploof's side, the minute I, minute I see Chris Rose jump in, I got to yeah. grab Rosie. Rosie, what are we doing here? I can't. Come on, Rosie. Right? And that's where I'm hugging Rosie. I'm not punching Rosie in the face. I love Chris Rose. I'm not punching I, him. I'm not. No. I punch whoever you got to punch. I think it's ridiculous <laughs> that we're pretending like we don't know Jake Bird. Jacob Timothy Bird, born December 4th, 1995, Mm. an American professional baseball pitcher for the Colorado Rockies of Major League Baseball. Obviously, the same guy who led the Pac-12 conference in earned run average in Mm. 2018 and was selected in the fifth round of the 2018 MLB draft, son of Joel and Heidi Bird, Ah, uh, who attended West Ranch High School in Stevenson Ranch, California. Um yeah, very unselected in the 2014 draft. He enrolled at UCLA. I mean, that Jake Bird, I feel like we all know who this is. I was stunned because obviously if you if you watch the video back, Jake Bird is taunting Bryce Harper. And that's what started the whole thing. And he's did like, he, what, he's, I didn't even see that. All he, he did he was say? like he was like looking at the Phillies dugout and like clapping with his glove. Someone in the Phillies dugout must have said something, and then he was like responding by like clapping after he got the the last out of the inning. But like, you're not good enough to taunt the Phillies dugout. Like, you're not the a thing guy. You, you're not that guy. The, and and, and the, I, I, I don't Jared. like. I looked at his baseball reference page after, and I was stunned to see like he doesn't suck. I was expecting to see like a five sixty eight ERA. And like a one seven eight whip, like he's not he's not that bad, honestly. He's not. 
but hey, hey, look, who the, the only, fuck you is just he? need to know you just need to know the guys in the room have your back. That's that's what allows individuals who you might not be readily familiar with to behave in a certain way. Right? Because in, in groups there could be like, hey, here's our leaders, here are our vocal leaders or whatever. But if you were to pick three guys that you just absolutely could not walk down a dark alley without on your team, those might not be guys that you're familiar with. And those might be the guys that do have the respect of the room. Those might be the guys that when shit hits the fan, the C's part for. Because everybody in the room knows that those motherfuckers ain't fucking around. These are the, Listen, these I, are the dudes. And so if everybody in the room has that guy's back, him being outwardly emotive and you know clapping his hands or whatever, it, it might not look or feel the way to you that it does inside that room because they all might know like, yo, Birdie, he might be a reliever, but we know when shit hits a fan, that's a guy who's got all of our back. So we'll have his back. Now, I don't know that that's the case. I'm just saying that 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 is the case in other instances. I just I can't speak to this one specific. A lot was made of, uh, you know, Bryce Harper being a phenom early and oh, Bryce Harper is going to be the next big thing and whatever, whatever, when he was in junior college and whatnot. I think Jake Bird has the final word on this, because according to David Gottlieb in a 2017 article for the Daily Bruin, uh, Jake, eight year old Jake Bird signed his friend's yearbooks, quote, save this autograph for when I'm playing in the major leagues. Mike. Love it. Mic Love drop. It. You just Love got it. what he told Bryce Harper. <laughs> save this shit, baby. Here's my autograph. Uh, That's a clown call. question. Hey, bro. <laughs> Bryce was yeah, fired up all series. I, he had a, the game before he called some random guy out in the crowd, started talking shit to a, a guy in the crowd. After hitting well, a cause, tank. Because Bryce Harper's out there with one fucking arm going, all you guys have been talking shit thinking I'm not this guy. I'm <laughs> the fuck. I am that dude. Do you understand what I'm doing with one arm out here? And you got the audacity to say some shit to me? Get out of my face. I will snap you with my healthy arm. I might rip off I've my other un- arm and beat you with it. What the fuck? I've been under the impression that many people on the Rockies have been playing with one arm. Is that not <laughs> what's happening there? Um <laughs> No, joke, not, not trying to be funny at all. I guarantee this is the longest we talk about the Rockies all year. This is their signature contribution to the 23 season. Because no of Bryce Harper. <laughs> Birdie uh, trying to fight their fucking $300 million man. <laughs> yeah, I guarantee it. Chris guarantee Bryant was out there. That the, forget, put that in the parlay. Chris Bryant and Bryce Harper are, are, are besties. Vegas. I didn't even see Chris Bryant. Where was he? He was out there. Yeah, he was out there. <laughs> just I probably, just, he, he's probably in the back going, "Hey, I fuck, I wouldn't if I were you. I wouldn't do that if I were you." I mean, it, it is Harper's crazy to the just shit out of you. <clears throat> you come back from surgery way earlier than expected, and within like a week or so, you're just in the middle of a brawl. <laughs> like, let's not do that, Bryce. Let's not. It's not worth it. You know, it's not worth it. Yeah. It's the Rockies. Come yeah, on, because you Lose imagine a like. I, I, Someone grabs that elbow. Some fuck. Ugh. Yeah, you don't, don't need, need that. that. Phillies fans don't need that, especially given the circumstances. But no. you're a fucking loser organization. <laughs> Every single one of you is a great line. And I just it it it, it hurt me the a o- little bit that o- Moose was on the front lines there. <laughs> the o- the only get, thing the only thing that get Moose made out that- of there. You just deserve that. The only thing that would have made that better is if Bryce just like stops in the middle and like separates himself from the crowd and just starts pointing up into the luxury suites, right? To yeah. like to, to Rocky's ownership, like this, you and this down here, you and this. This is your fault. You are responsible for all of this. Get the well, fuck out of here. Bryce Harper, people forget Bryce Harper is a huge baseball fan. Like when we yes. were having these conversations with Bryce Harper about doing the podcast, like he came on and we did a, like an extensive podcast about his, his life in baseball. He wanted to run it back and yeah. come on the pod just to talk about what was going on in the game. Like he was in like, yeah, I'll be a co-host <laughs> with you guys. Like he wanted to talk yeah. about the game 
while he was in it, but talk about like shit like this. Like if this happened he between has, the Cardinals and the Cubs, he wanted to come on and break be, it all down. So he'd be talking about it. Yeah. So like when when Bryce Harper is saying that you're a fucking loser franchise about the Rockies, it's because he's probably putting his baseball fan cap on being like, how are the Rockies doing this? Like, how is this organization going to trade a guy right. like Nolan Arenado and give the Cardinals $50 million to take this player? Like, he's breaking it down the way that, like, Jay Haywood and and being like, this is just complete ineptitude. How are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Who's running this place? And because he gets to be a player on the field, he can also go there and just right in their face be like you're yeah, a fucking well, loser <laughs> he's he's looking at moose going do you have any idea what the next two years of your nucleus looks like why are you sitting here yelling at me get the fuck out of my face <laughs> yeah like whoa what what yeah. Dude, i know what your roster looks like <laughs> in fucking, where are they at this i know what's i know what the sky socks are all about yeah. get out of here uh, it makes it that much coming. funnier when you when you think about it that way where if you're a Rockies fan and you're seeing this this brawl ensue, then you're obviously on Team Rockies because that's your that's your uh, <laughs> that's your fan that's your team. But you have to look at if you're a Rockies fan that Bryce Harper is the personification of the Rockies fan base. <laughs> like he wants Bryce to Harper fight just the yelling, team. Dick Monfort didn't invest properly in the roster this year. Yes. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is the fan base personification going down on the field and saying to their did, face, you are a fucking loser franchise. <laughs> did did Bryce Harper just became the Colorado Rockies fans favorite player? Uh, he has to. If 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 interpreted <laughs> correctly, Bryce Harper is the guy that kind of told it like it was about the Colorado Rockies to the Colorado Rockies. <laughs> Damn. Like I can't imagine that the Rockies had a fan fest like the Red Sox did and ownership was up there allowing the fans to boo them. I don't think the Rockies open themselves up to that. So Bryce Harper took it upon himself to be like, this is, this is how the fans feel about your team. <laughs> I think the Rockies yeah, fans don't what, If you've just, they're just going for the $3 blue moons, really like that's the Rockies fans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, what you're finding out about Harp is, is he, he ain't pulling any punches. Like if you just had a cheeseburger and, and are going to try a dress on, don't ask, Harp, how you look in the dress? Because he's just going to let you like you look. You look fat. I'll be honest, kind of fat. He's yeah. going to tell you. Well, speaking of Blue Moon, some beers can say that they're brewed for baseball, but only Blue Moon is brewed by baseball. Beer and baseball can just go together. No beer goes better than the one that was literally born in a ballpark. Blue Moon was created at Coors Field in Denver, Colorado, home of the Colorado Rockies. <laughs> It's the natural choice for opening day and all season long. Uh, if you are at you're at Coors Field over the weekend, you got to see Bryce Harper and the boys go to town, and it's a good old series between the Phillies and the Rockies. Crack open an ice cold blue moon and enjoy that one uh, with your storied franchise. With its refreshing flavor, with Valencia orange peel for a subtle sweetness and hints of coriander. Blue Moon Belgian style wheat ale is a one of a kind beer that's made brighter. It's carefully crafted and full flavored with refreshing notes and a smooth, creamy finish. Blue Moon was brewed by baseball to give you a dose of nostalgia and get you excited for the new season. Why strike out with the same old beer when you can get something that's one of a kind? It's bold flavor, bright explosion of color and iconic orange slice ritual guarantees a one of a kind beer experience. Perfect for spring weather. Best served with its signature orange garnish to showcase its beautiful bright color. A beer this good only comes around once in a blue moon, but you can enjoy it all season long. Bring the ballpark to you with Blue Moon Belgian style wheat ale. It's one of a kind every time. Check out shop.bluemoonbrewingcompany.com for beer and baseball merch or visit get.bluemoonbeer.com slash rocket to find Blue Moon delivery options. That is get.bluemoonbeer.com slash rocket. Blue Moon made brighter. Celebrate responsibly. Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado Ale. <sighs> Man, that was, uh, that was fun. Rocky's fan, Bryce, is, uh, that's just a, that's a character that I did not think we would get to, to see develop. Uh, but speaking <laughs> of character development, Luis Robert Lou Bob. Lou Bob. He, uh, he's not here for the bullshit anymore. Since getting benched on April 29th, I ran the numbers this morning. Luis Robert 
is second in the majors in batting average. He's hitting 422. And he leads the majors in on base percentage, slugging percentage, OPS, isolated power, weighted on base average, hits, home runs, runs, extra base hits, and total bases. <laughs> Dude, he was injured. He just needed a day off. That's all it took. He just needed a day off. He's just playing through some stuff. That's all. Luis, I mean, hey, getting bench works. We we ran through the numbers of Javi Baez since he got benched in Toronto back in April. And the video went viral of him getting benched. It was embarrassing. And then he just went off. Luis Robert didn't hustle down the line. Video goes viral. People are saying this is unacceptable. Bench him. He gets benched. Suspend him. Kick him off the tour, Doug. Uh, He has been legitimately, unequivocally, the best hitter in baseball since he was benched for lollygagging down the line. Uh, I think think you could go one of two ways with this conversation. There's the negative way. If you're a White Sox fan listening right now, you're probably like, go ahead, say it. Like, oh, what team is he going to end up with the trade deadline? We don't have to go that way. We don't have to go that way. Um, is Luis Robert, I don't, you know, when we talked about the White Sox core and how disappointing that this team has been and the guys that haven't taken a step forward, uh, we mentioned Tim Anderson, we mentioned Dylan Cease. I think it's fair like to like, is Luis Robert a guy that you're comfortable putting in that same tier as a Dylan Cease and a Tim Anderson for uh, like these pieces of the White Sox core, they belong. Like we can keep these guys because I've heard some yeah. some some trade rumors about Giolito as well. Well, you yeah, Giolito because he's an arm that I think people are going to seek because he's experienced some some frustrating moments in Chicago. It could be a difference of changing scenery for him. Um, sometimes things just run their course in an organization with a staff. And you do need a breath of fresh air. I said this about La Pantera, which was he is probably the poster child at the moment for guys who are underachieving on this team that feel like they should be having a much greater impact, much greater impact. So there's no question that Luis Robert is a name that you put into that nucleus conversation. That core combo has to be absolutely has to be what they're missing, though, is what they had in Abreu, which was that definitive leader, the definitive lighthouse. Say what you will about his productivity and all that completely separate conversation. What the clubhouse is looking for is a leader. They need that much. And frankly, right now, when you start to look at the roster and you look at the paydays, you look at who's think about what we've just seen from Tim Anderson. Think about what we just saw, the conversation, right? surrounding his uh w- what may have been said what was allegedly said by Tim Anderson on base you guys saw that so like do they have a leader is there a leader defined I, that's the biggest question for me in that clubhouse i so you can have the conversation think, about core guys that need to be here where does it start i I don't think there's any question that Luis Robert can be a part of that grouping and may even be more securely in that group right now than Dylan Cease, given how his season is going. But like, this is also a guy whose most pressing issue, other than kind of like an, an uneven development curve, has been a lack of availability. So it, it's never really been, is Luis Robert good when he's on the field? I mean, he entered this season with a career 122 OPS plus, And what makes him, what separates him from a guy like Eloy Jimenez, is that Luis Robert is an impact defensive player even when the bat isn't necessarily red hot. And like to the point about like he's fifth in baseball in wins above replacement among outfielders right now. And that's just with, you know, with a decent chunk of his season having been not all that effective to this point uh, up until turning it on. Uh, I think he's I think he's clearly he might be the single most valuable asset on the team. Uh, I think from a from a roster building standpoint, and I don't think even if they undergo a retooling or a or a sell off at the trade deadline, I I would be shocked if Luis Robert is among the people that are headed out the door as opposed to 
a guy that they keep to build around. What, what do, do you think? What he's, do we make do you think of, he's still with the the White Sox organization after this trade deadline? Luis Robert, I I do. I would put the odds of that at something like ninety to ten. I would be really really surprised if he's among the group that's traded. I think to me that's more of a, a guy. Some of the guys you named, Lucas Giolito being first and foremost on that list. I think Eloy Jimenez would even be more likely, um, depending on again how they view Tim Anderson as a. A, a locker room presence what, what? or a piece to build around moving forward. Like, I just don't think you can trade Luis Robert, given that he's 25, playing really, really well and under contract. Um, he's he's the guy that this team needs to be built around if it's going to have any hope over the next half decade. I mean, are, are, are we just like, does the Tim Anderson thing? <laughs> Alec Bohm was fucking vilified, <laughs> vilified. For what he said as a Philadelphia Philly. Yeah, for like six Tim Anderson hours. Essentially, essentially says the same thing, right? What did yeah, he I say? Did he say I mean, like Tim Anderson sucks. comes with a lot more credibility on that particular topic if he's dissatisfied with where he's playing or the situation overall. Like Alec Baum had been there for oh. one second, right? And hey, 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 Jay, hey, you're not getting, I'm not arguing that. At okay, all. Okay. At all. Not at all. No, trust me. <laughs> what Tim Anderson has been through in that order, yes, I, I agree with you. That is why I raised the point, though, about the leadership yeah. in that room. I'm not saying that Tim Anderson isn't justified for voicing his displeasure. That is not what I'm saying at all. But we have to acknowledge that that much has happened. And if we're for having sure. a conversation about the core of this team, and you have a guy like Tim Anderson who could very well be the core of the apple and he's the one who's like yo what the fuck right now like fucking uncle this fucking place if that's happening then i think it's fair to start to look around the room and go all right well who is the leader here and what's that going to look like moving forward if we're having a conversation about keeping guys together and guys departing then it's it's very fair to ask what that looks like and you can't just gloss over that no, you're right. I mean, I, it's a little bit unfair to use wins above replacement exactly this way, but I do think it it sheds light on how important Robert is to the team and how shitty the rest of the team has been. The offense overall has generated 1.7 wins above replacement this season. Luis Robert by himself has generated 1.7 wins above replacement this season. So it's basically just him and everybody else has been bombs. basically just replacement level on that team. Um, and, you know, I if they do decide to sell off, like, I, I think it's interesting. Like, what is the value of a Lance Lynn? What is the value of a Lucas Giolito um, given, like, the really uneven performances? Like, Giolito, in theory, still has upside and youth and all that sort of stuff, but he's been exceedingly inconsistent over the last few years. I just... I Robert, to me, is, if things click, He's an MVP candidate, like an inner circle MVP yep. candidate. If things click offensively, like that's how good his baseline is with his with his defense. Um, whether that ever happens, you you, you would probably bet oh, against. You know it, what? But um, I was just going to say this: Jay, he can run into as a, as, a half decade of five win seasons. Yeah. And as somebody who is in the card collecting hobby, this is a dude who you pay attention to because you almost get the sense that the ceiling for him could be closer than you would like to think. So when you start thinking about holding a guy's stock or moving a guy's stock, watching Lou Bob come out of this little funk and start to make a little noise has got some folks excited in the card collecting hobby because you're thinking <laughs> about, all right, now he's, now he's back to producing. He's back to fulfilling the narrative of everything that we're talking about here, the greatness to come, blah, blah, blah. Well, if that never comes, now might be the time for you to capitalize or cash in on a Lou Bob if you are of the ilk that I just don't know that it maximizes itself later down the road. I, I want to go. I just want to go on record. Jared started this by saying benching works. I want to go on record definitively as saying I don't think anything has changed with Javier Baez and that he is still bad. <laughs> That's just so podcast number 99. I'm saying Javi Baez is still bad. 
He's eight for his last 34 with one walk and a 542 OPS. Nothing is cured about this guy. He happened to run into some baseballs over a course of four or five games, which, you know, even he uh, is liable to do every now and then. Javi Baez, still bad. Benching <laughs> didn't work. Wow. <laughs> Struggle. <laughs> I've been watching this Tim Anderson clip the whole time just to read his lips. So he, everyone thinks he says, I hate this place. The, some White Sox reporter tweeted, can confirm that Tim Anderson was talking to Jose Abreu about the pitch clock at first base on Sunday. Not what was, uh, not, not what I, has been falsely speculated and reported. He could. And it's hate like, bro, who's pace. your source? That's what he Tim said. Anderson. I, I, yeah, that like Tim Anderson I told you he pace. didn't say it. Like we're reading his fucking lips. He did. He, he didn't say pitch he clock. Just shakes his head. I, I, because I, no. I, I, the, the lip reading shit. It's you could stare at it and you don't really know and you can just confuse yourself and go in circles. And if someone says he said this and you look at his lips, you're going to think he says this. I don't know if he said I hate this place because he says I hate this place. It looks like <laughs> it, but then he says one other word. So I don't know if he said that. Yeah. There's no way he said pitch clock, in my opinion, because I watched it, the sequence. There's was nothing it, to do with the pitch clock at all during that whole two minutes. No, and there and was, he was it was the last word. I'm not looking at the video, but it's the last word he said, man. Like I hate this place, man. Yeah. Or like like what like man. You know what I mean? Like I hate this place. Man. See, you know, now, because now you're gonna now you're gonna I, go, uh, who, get who's my brain on first loop. base. It's Jose Abreu. Yeah. yeah, who's a, yeah? So so does Abreu does Abreu say something? Because Abreu could just be like you know without moving his lips, Abreu could be like, "Yo, I know," and then you know Anderson's response is like, "Man, you know," just kind of conferring because that's probably a guy who knows what it's like, right? <laughs> yeah. So if he didn't yeah. say that, I mean, was there? Yeah, he said the pitch clock, but there, yeah. Was that the only I'd be person more that asked about him a guy Anderson? who didn't hate that place? <laughs> if I was a fan, you should think, hate what's going on there. I, I would think the irony of the situation is that White Sox fans are like, we hate this place, that we hate this team, sell the team. And then Tim Anderson is like, I hate this place. And White Sox fans are like, what the fuck? The fuck do you mean? <laughs> like it doesn't it doesn't add up. It's, like I, I feel like it should be a rallying cry where it's like, yeah, like we all hate this place. But instead, well, yeah, like, the White Sox fans are like, no, we, fuck, we hate it because of you. Leave. We hate you. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. He was directly the allegedly was saying that because he was getting booed a little bit because he didn't advance on like a like a pass ball. So he's saying, I hate this place because the fans are fucking pieces of shit. So that's why the fans. <laughs> Like that's not why the fans hate this place. They hate them because the players are pieces of shit, and the players allegedly hate it because the fans are pieces of shit. And that's where the conflict lies at the moment. <laughs> that's yeah. that's the mix up. That's just the mix yeah. up. Yeah. Mm. Well, I I hope they, <laughs> I hope they they can settle their differences at some point. Um. Couple a uh, couple of things before we get out of here. Um, Rays Yanks over the weekend. That was a a very I'm gonna say surprising effort from the New York Yankees. I was expecting the Rays to go in Came there and just all absolutely the way steamroll. Back. Yeah, I mean they still lost all but, uh, the way it, back. What do you mean? Well, they were down fucking what? Nine or whatever, or what was what was the score? Which game came came back and made it interesting? The, the fucking the one that Yandy hit a grand slam in. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They were down. I think it was six nothing or something like that. Yeah, I had to take the L on that. That one. was the McClanahan game, right? Uh, yeah, McClanahan. I think. Yeah, no, was it? Yeah, he caught. Yeah, it up. was wasn't yeah. that the first game of this? Yeah, McClanahan did not look good. Um, no. in that start, but the Rays. Oh hey, uh, the, oh good. The Rays beat their brains in eight to two on Thursday. It's a four game set. Um, Yankees, they grab one on Friday. And uh, that was the, was that the comeback game? Comeback was Saturday. Yeah, it must have been. Saturday. Yankees win on Friday and Saturday. And then Tampa has their revenge on Sunday with the, what, Taylor Walls Grand Slam? 
So they split. That was a that that would be quite the playoff matchup between those two teams. Raising the Yanks, um, especially with all the, the cheating allegations, which <laughs> I will not entertain. I don't believe in it. I just think and I, this is what I said on Twitter because a Rays fan had tweeted me being like, what do you think about all like the cheating allegations with the Rays? And I was like, well, I, I think when you look at a team like the Tampa Bay Rays, who greatly lack star power and spending ability, and you see guys that you've never heard of. I mean, a casual, like if, if you follow baseball, you know who these guys are, but a casual fan is not going to know who like Harold Ramirez and, and Taylor Walls and all these guys are with like their 900 and 1,000 OPSs. So naturally, you're going to get people being like, well, what's going on here? And it's not about what's going on here. You just have to accept what's happening. They're, they're really fucking well, good. There's okay, going to come okay. a time where there's regression, no doubt. Like the guys that have the 950 and 1200 OPSs for the Tampa Bay Rays, like that's not sustainable. I think we can all acknowledge that. But for now, it's happening. Like you've got guys collectively getting off to hot starts. You just have the Tampa Bay Rays way of they've they've got three starters. They've got openers. They're they've got the most bullpen innings in the in the big leagues right now. Uh, and the you know, it, the pitching has never been even date, dating back to when they dropped the devil and just went to the Rays, <clears throat> dating back to 2008, pitching's always been their thing. The the Garza, Shields, like those days, um, that's always been their thing since they became a winning franchise. But now you're seeing like, oh, wait, now they can swing it a little bit too. Like now, like, you know, that's a lineup that's going to have some pop and some thunder in it. Um, you've got the Laos and the Lows and the Ramirez's and the Rosarenas and the Yandy Diaz, it's, it's, I mean, you just have to tip your cap. I know that you don't want to. I know that for, for whatever reason, people don't want to accept the Rays as a team that's a legitimate threat. I know that we mock them for their uh, philosophies of not necessarily gaming the system, but not doing it the way that you're used to. And some people don't like that. It's like, oh, they're winning, but you're not winning the way that you well, should be winning. They're, uh, they're about to be challenged. They are about to be challenged for the reasons that I talked about last time when we talked about the Rays and how they just seemingly continue to run guys out there. And I, I told you they're not too concerned with whether or not you're going to pop. They almost know that that's going to happen. And so they're preparing themselves for when that happens. And when I say that, I mean preparing themselves to identify other guys that they can get into a position to be productive and then should things go south. They move on again with Drew Rasmussen going down. That's big. They're going to have. Oh, 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 yeah, I'd say <laughs> immediately I'd on say. the 60 day. And we know why we've got a pretty good idea why. And if you don't know why, then I suggest you get some friends that used to pitch for the Rays or maybe still do pitch for the Rays. Um, so plugging and playing on the mound. Just got a little, just got a little more difficult to do because now you're now you're replacing forty five innings worth of sub three ERA baseball out of Drew Rasmussen. That's what you have to go and replace. So great, you've got starters, you've got openers, fantastic. So name one of those, and now there's your first two innings of Rasmussen's outing. Now who are you going to go to? Because you got to you got to think about covering the other five innings that Rasmussen was accounting for as well. And now you have to think about doing that with an extra day taken from you. You don't have that day of rest now because, well, all these guys are pitching for Rasmussen, who's no longer pitching. So now you see how everybody's responsibility gets a little greater. Everybody's workload just got a little heavier. Now you have to identify somebody else that can come along and help alleviate that workload, whether it's in the starting rotation or whether it's via the bullpen, a guy who can give you multiple innings in a series multiple times, two innings the opening day, two and a third the last day, whatever it is. But this is a fucking blow, man. This is a blow. Yeah, they got they have four starters on the I'm, IL, four, and who would have probably all been in the open, like the legit starters. And you're saying that's because of their usage, the way the Rays well, are, are using them? I, I'm saying... Oh, well, I'm, I'm saying that the injuries are going to happen, right? Like that's inevitable, not with the race specifically in baseball. The injuries in baseball. We were talking about 
the Rays and how they just seem to be able to, you know, bottle lightning every year. Like every time it rains, they figure out how to bottle lightning and then they just unleash it on baseball. Well, well it, right now, as <clears throat> as we said, all of those arms that helped get them off to the start that they're off to right now, not not all of them, but what, two, three of them are down. Yeah. Well, between Springs and Rasmussen, they got 208 ERA and 11 starts uh, between the two of them. So that's, but like to the, to Dallas's point and Joey's question, like it, it's not a one way street, right? Like there are, yes, there are things about the Rays philosophy that maybe make the pitching situation a little bit more volatile while absolutely maximizing how nasty some of those pitchers are capable of being. And the, and the pitchers have to, they're not bystanders in this effort, right? They have to sign up for this plan. They, to some extent, they know what's going on and, and what the risks are. And Drew Rasmussen specifically, I believe this is, if he does end up having to go down this path, this would be his third Tommy John. So like third part, yeah, part of the Rays deal is also that they're acquiring pitchers who might yes. be, and I think Kyle Boddy, mm-hmm. uh, Bodie on, uh, uh, from driveline noted this where they're, they, they are also acquiring people who are, uh, whose values depressed because they are uh, injured or have been injured. So like there is a cause and effect thing going on here. And it's not just that the Rays are saying, Hey, throw 40% sliders or whatever. Um, but uh, it, well, well, it is Jay, still something you need to deal with from a roster standpoint too, right? Like to Dallas's thing, like it's going to be tested and maybe but, Taj Bradley comes up and he's the answer, but you know, they're, they're down to two guys and glass now is still not back. But now, and I just want you to remember what you just said. They are essentially, and they're not afraid to admit that they are a reclamation project organization. So what happens if you are reclaiming a pitcher who has been subjected to injury? And then you're asking this pitcher to perform in a certain manner that could potentially line him up or get him closer to the same blowouts he's experienced in the past. Now we're talking. Now we're starting to shed light on how things go. Okay, so your high-risk, high-reward approach has paid off, but we know that the risk part comes with a Drew Rasmussen hitting the 60-day the minute something pops up. Why? Because this would be his third Tommy John repair. So we understand that we've asked Drew Rasmussen to do some things that could very well get him to this point again. He's understood the risk factor that comes along with playing baseball and throwing a baseball in any fashion, fastball, slider, split, whatever. Inherent risk comes with it. So if we're knocking on the door of our third TJ and I'm out there ripping sliders at 40 plus percent, then I probably have an idea of what my future could look like. And I'm a rocket till the wheels fall off. I didn't realize it was his third TJ. If that's what we're headed towards, that is fucking has. And, and there's you, a can lot you of, think of any other examples of, people, of that? Jason Isringhausen. He had three. I believe he had three. How many fucking tendons do you, like you take a tendon out of <laughs> your many leg? People, as thought, many I, dead people, dead people, buddy, dead people. They got, you, they put, got you take stuff. tendons out of cadavers. Yes, 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 yes. If you've taken the one from my wrist, and you've taken the one from my two legs. Well, I'm all out, but I got a I got a dead uncle. <laughs> who? That's crazy. This son of a bitch I had think, forearms the size of thighs. Like, yeah, I think his tendons will work. <laughs> I think Hong Chi Kuo uh, had four. Ooh, four. I think that's the. Uh, in as much as a record exists, I believe that's the record. That's like that's like Ric Flair. It's like dude, seventy eight years Woo! old, still like going through flaming tables with thumbtacks in him. It's like, bro, just stop. <laughs> you don't have to do this anymore. Just please stop. Four Tommy John surgeries is outrageous. Three is as well. I guess it all depends on how old you are. Like if you're super unfortunate and you've got three by the like the, the, your age thirty three season, it's like all right, you still you can still give it a run, but. I mean, God damn. Well, and that's the that other is. thing too, is you got kids these days, you know, I've, I've joked about it for the last decade. <laughs> you got kids who are like, oh man, it's my junior year in high school. I'm only throwing 79. I'm going to go outside and break my arm and maybe I'll get TJ for Christmas, you know, and then I come <laughs> back and 
I'll be able to. It's like that's not how we do this. Like you don't. No. So if you've had TJ early, I know the mindset is, oh great, I'm ahead of the curve. Like I already got it taken care of, right? It's not like fucking wisdom teeth. Like some have them, some don't. You get yours pulled and you're fine. Like no, this could this could actually derail you. You know, this yeah. could change a whole lot for you. Yeah. That's crazy. I know pedroya has got a dead guy's knee cap. I think he got a p- replaced dead his guy's like, knee cap. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he didn't <laughs> need it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, hey, your silent fucking mockery was <laughs> what did paid off greater than any laugh. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Dick. Oh, God. All right. We got to take a break and talk about Zinn nicotine pouches. We're always talking about what a team needs to get to number one, but Zinn nicotine pouches are already there. Zinn has helped millions of people achieve lasting chains, earning the title of America's number one nicotine pouch. If you're a smoker or you're a dipper looking to make a change, look no further than Zinn. Zinn is made with six simple ingredients and is available in a wide range of varieties, including spearmint, citrus, and even coffee. And it's available in two strengths so you can control your nicotine satisfaction. Because it's discreet, you can enjoy it anywhere, anytime, so you never have to miss a moment of the game. Plus, every can of Zinn earns you points towards premium items like tailgating gear, top-of-the-line tech, Zinn swag, even gift cards. Find your Zinn at your local convenience store or online at Zinn.com. That's Zinn, Z-Y-N dot com. Warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Um, my, uh, my final thought, Josh Naylor, three bombs in a row for the guards. Eighth inning tank. Uh, he's, been, he's been on a heater. Shout out to Josh Naylor and the Cleveland Guardians. Um, that division is not over. The guards can still, as much as you see all the negative run differentials in that, in that, in that division, the guards are at negative 23. It ain't over. They're only three and a half back of the Minnesota Twins. So, Contractually, someone is required to win the division. <laughs> yep, someone's got to do it. So it is not over for anyone except for the Royals, and it is over for them. Yeah. See you next year. See um, ya. Well, that chopped down. I'll just go next. That chopped down one of my final thoughts. So thank you for giving Naylor some credit. Uh, rapid fire here on some nugs. Shout out Mitch Keller uh, of the Pirates. I know I've kind of been the, the sober voice on the, uh, on the pirate ship this year, but uh, seven scoreless <laughs> innings with zero walks and 13 strikeouts. He becomes just the third. Pirates pitcher in franchise history to ever have a str- uh, start with 13 strikeouts and zero walks. And he's the first since Francisco Liriano did so in 2016. And by the way, sometimes it takes time. Dallas will tell you. It never really happened for Dallas, but he could tell you. Uh, it takes time for pitching prospects to fully mature and develop. Uh, and you don't want to bail on him too soon. And Mitch Keller is a good example of that. 6.17 ERA in 23 starts in 21. Got a little bit better last year and has been even better this year, 2-3-8 ERA in nine starts. Might be the you know number two type starter that the Pirates have been looking for. They could use a number three, a number four, a number five, a number one, too. Uh, so having a number two would be good. Um, Max Scherzer, we've obviously been all over this one. 94.0 miles per hour on his four-seamer in his most recent start. That is his highest of the 2023 season, and he generated his highest whiff rate with the four-seamer since his start on May 1st of last season. So uh, also didn't allow a homer, uh, which is another thing that's been a problem. So nice step forward for him. Um, yeah. Oh, and Garrett Cole, uh, 10 innings pitch, seven earned runs against the Rays, 46 and two thirds innings pitch, seven earned runs against the rest of baseball. Those are my final thoughts. So you think the Rays are cheating too? Hmm. <laughs> Not ready to say it. Mm. Okay. Wow. Wow. People are saying it. I'm People look, are saying it. Not me. They well, are, I, I've seen it too, but I, I'm not ready. No. I appreciate the bucko love, Jay. Appreciate the bucko love. Uh, I'm just going to sprinkle balance. a little love. I'm just going to... Oh, but You know what? Before we get there, because I did hear the prospect dig, um, I'm going to take a little page out of Pat the Bats book. That's right. 
Pat Burrell used to give Mark Mulder shit about <clears throat> being drafted in a round, you know, like what, what that's like to be drafted in a round. Um, cause Pat, Pat didn't know what that was like to be drafted in a round, like to be a first rounder. Cause Pat was the first pick. And so he used to, you know, he used to j- joke like, Hey, what's that like being, being drafted in a round? Cause I was the first overall, like, and then they picked after me. So I'm sure it's pretty cool to be a first rounder. That must, must feel nice. Jay prospect status would have been cool. Would have been. Problem is I flew right fucking past that because I went from mm. suspect to a big leaguer. I didn't have time for the prospect shit. Just no, nah, you're right too to you're too blue collar, you're so. too grindy. Yep. Too much guile, too much grime, too much guts. You got the I, don't need, I don't need the shine, baby. You just you just put me that's right. Through fucking with my three G Wi Fi, I found my way to the fucking big league coliseum. <laughs> guts, grime, guile, and grit. <laughs> <laughs> Josh Young, aka Young Money. Josh Young. Uh just shouting out the Texas Tech Red Raider, the Texas Tech Red Raider. Um his name's all over the the rookie leaderboard and you very well could be staring at your American League rookie of the year, Josh Young. The Masataki Yoshida got- die. Ooh. Well, hey, I hope see, peace. we're going to need to re-record the podcast. Is it cool that I just put him on the radar? Yeah, that's is, that, is that that's okay? Fine. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Go ahead. Thanks. Go ahead. Yeah, there's a lot of game left. A lot yeah. of game left. A lot of season left. Um, Joseph? A lot of season. Couple, I just got this weird information that Angel Hernandez hasn't umpired since April 3rd. So where's Angel? It's a weird tip. Where is Angel? Uh, that's Angel Hernandez is missing. I hope nothing bad happened, but you know, people are gonna make fun of this shit. But I I this is what I've been told. Hasn't umpired since April 3rd. Could be another lawsuit coming down MOB's throat. Be on the lookout for Ooh. that. Whoa. And God, that yeah. was inf- information that I just got. Also, another thing, going back to a f- past final thought is the in game interviews. Did you see what Tristan cast this last cast this last night? Fucking guy handled it like a champ, but they're interviewing him at first base on Mother's Day and his mom passed away and they're asking him about his mom who died while he's playing Major League Baseball, which I've been told is the hardest fucking sport ever invented. It's impossible to play. You can't do it, but somehow it's okay. You can interview him during the games. It's not that big of a deal. They can do two things at once and then ask him about a personal tragedy on the worst day ever while he's trying to play and interview and be sad. And it's like, why the fuck do they even do these things? It's crazy. It's a crazy question to ask. I, I would bench. I would. I didn't hear the question. Who asked the question? Gravity. I would venture to guess that that was probably cleared to an extent. I don't like, think hey, it was. It, there's no way because I said this on name redacted. Um, when Casas first got called up, like everyone was kind of specifically told, like, do not ask him about his mom. Like, don't bring it up. That was like a PSA. Yeah, I, I still I'm, I'm not I'm not saying that Carl Ravitch wasn't made aware of that. Yeah, I, I, don't, I just, don't I don't think he was aware. I don't think he was aware, but this is what it was. You know that Gorman, you know, we had Alex Cora on. I know your mom passed away when you were young. What does Mother's Day mean to you and, and your brother? Yeah, the, uh, you know, what happened was unfortunate to me, but I have so many mother figures in my life. Um, whether they have my last name or whether they don't, um, I've had so much support from everybody, uh, you know, around my, in and around my circle. Yeah. That I, I don't even feel like I missed out on anything. You know, I know she's watching me every day. I know she's, uh, you know, smiling, proud of me, but uh, yeah, for the most part, I think, uh, you know, I've, I've been all right. So I'm not doing baby. Yeah. So yeah, look, look, I think um, I'll just when he homered, when he hit his first big league homer last year, uh, someone asked him about his mom and then after was told, like, don't ever fucking ask him about his mom. Yeah, I, I, I would say this and this is um, this is as far as I would ever speculate on something like this. My guess is my thought is it was probably an untimely incident and regardless of whether it was untimely or not when you lose a parent how you process that and how you deal with that 
is very different from anything else. And I don't think anybody should ever even try to explain away or help a person try to process that you just, that's just shit you just don't do. And especially if you don't know the background, right? Because you don't want to open something like that up. So it's unfortunate that maybe Ravi wasn't tipped off to that. I don't think he was like, he's not trying to, you know, ask a question that nobody else has the balls to ask. Like, that's not what he was doing. I think he probably just didn't know, didn't know what, you know, uh, some of the folks who cover the Red Sox daily do know. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, to your point though, Joe, Ra- that's Ravi, about Ravi's not that dude. Ravi's, Ravi's no. not that dude that's going to like try and get you like the gotcha question or be like, oh, I'm going to. No. Yeah. I, I don't think he knew. I mean, obviously it's. I wouldn't have asked that question even without the knowledge that it was a big no, no from for him personally. <clears throat> Some people are comfortable talking about that. Uh, I don't think that he was, but, you know, Tristan handled it great. I think he was very professional about it. So. But anyways, uh, Jake's takes. Uh, one more quick shout out to Nolan Arenado for ruining my weekend. Um, Bro, I forgot to fucking kick it to the Nolan interview. We got to put that in somewhere earlier, much earlier. Yeah, we'll we'll record that at the end. But uh, he literally said to your face, to my face, that he likes how our pitching staff has been looking and then proceeded to homer in all three games. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Nolan. <laughs> That's outstanding. Yeah. Of course he would. That would look fucking meatballs down the gut. Oh, that is so fucking disrespectful. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I would have fucking punched him if he would have said something. Oh, oh no one. <laughs> <laughs> not funny. <laughs> hey, Jared, your boys are looking really good on the map. Oh, fuck. Oh, Nolan spent fucking three days in Boston taking naked hacks in front of the fucking mirror in his hotel room, just salivating over this fucking shit. <laughs> Oh shit! Oh, no one's got the Ubers for everybody on the Sox staff. We're making sure everybody gets to the ballpark. <laughs> Holy fuck! All fastballs too. Mm-hmm. Oh my god! Oh fuck! I needed that. That is <laughs> that is special. <laughs> Jared, boys, you're looking good. This oh. open up the voice, man. Jared, who told you your staff was good? Nolan Arenado. <laughs> I mean, he homered off James Paxton and Chris Sale. Chris Sale went eight <laughs> innings, three hits, one earned run with like nine strikeouts. Like he hey, and I'm, James Paxton <laughs> also had nine strikeouts. So it the only damage done. Like the Red Sox should have won that series two games to one. Kenley Jansen blew oh, two fuck. saves. Like he homered off Paxton and Sale. That was like the only damage that they allowed. They they fucking shoved. He and then he homered yeah, off well, Ryan you know Brazier. Who- he homered off Ryan Brazier on Sunday, who promptly was designated for assignment. So you know yeah, I, know, so I love Nolan. Be- <laughs> you know I love Nolan. But I mean, he didn't it's we're not talking about a pitching staff that sucks. No. He absolutely Sailing- bitch slapped the fucking Red Sox. Yeah, he did. He did, but that I'm not I'm not letting any bombs be lobbed towards Chris Sale and James Paxton. They pitched they pitched up well, uh, well, no, great no, games. No one will take care of that. No one will yeah. take care of lobbing the bombs. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh we'll see you on Wednesday. We go.